Hello, hi, uh, I'm Kim Belair, and I'm here with Fami, and uh, we're here to talk narrative in a kind of fireside chat format. Um, if this is your first talk at the convention, welcome to Ludonericon. And uh, if it's not your first talk, then uh, I hope you continue to enjoy these talks. Uh, and I think we can get started. Um, Fami, do you want to do the first set of introductions? <laughs> Sure, sure. Thank you. Thanks for the opening, Kim, because I won't be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my name is Muhammad Fahmi, but you can just call me Fahmi. Uh, I'm an indie developer and a freelance writer. Um, I work on a game called Coffee Talk and what comes after. And right now I'm working on some other stuff while also helping Indonesian indie developers to do anything so either either narrative design consultancy or pitching to publisher or marketing and PR and random stuff that puts rice on the plate that's okay so that's really awesome and I think we have a lot in common in that way um, so I'm yeah uh, as I said earlier I'm Kim Belair um, I'm the CEO of Sweet Baby Inc and we're a narrative development company so as part of that I do like um, narrative design and writing but another a major initiative that we try to work towards is getting like young marginalized writers or not even young marginalized writers, but like emerging marginalized writers um, into the industry, getting them credits, getting them pay, trying to get, you know, folks into that system um, as, as, as gently and with as much support as possible. Um, and I think that's so much a part of the work that we all do, especially like devs from marginalized backgrounds. It's like, there's there's two parts of the work that you do, right, in games. It's like, okay, you do your practical day-to-day -day stuff, and then you do everything else that, you know, is about the greater industry and the community, I think. Yeah. And so I guess my first question would be like, just to start with like the day-to-day, -day, um, what is, what's what's your, your background in games? Like, where have you started out? You wanna talk about like, games that you've written for, stuff, the way that you got started, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I joined game industry around 10 years ago by working in a mobile game company called Gameloft. So I did some programming, and then I, I, I'm... I'm a bad programmer, so I don't know how how how, how come I became a programmer. But uh, I I changed division to game design, and then uh, I quit because I don't like doing what I'm doing. I mean, when you're working with a bigger bigger company, you don't decide what you want to make, right? Yeah. You have to follow what they want you to make, including an RPG about a fashion, which I don't understand at all. <laughs> Which sounds good, but I don't understand them at all. And so I decided to quit. And I became a journalist because... Oh, wow. A game journalist, yeah. Because I wanted to make my own studio, but I thought I was still young. I know nothing. I have no money. So by doing journalistic, I can learn from people who have succeeded or have failed. And I can learn how to write better because I want to be a writer. And I get money while doing all of those things. And I become a journalist for three years, and then I become a marketing and PR for Toge Productions, an uh, indie developer and publisher based in Indonesia. And I pitch Coffee Talk, which brings me to where I am now, I yeah. guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, that's a quick history. Like, I mean, how about you? How did you start Sweet Baby? And so. How did it's, you start your career? Yeah. It's funny because I I have a similar, I think, moments to you where I initially started out in the industry as a community developer because my background was actually in marketing. I was working in, oh, like, in nice. brand voice. I have my, market, my degree is in marketing. And mm. I was hired at Ubisoft first as a community developer on Far Cry 4. And oh, I mean, I was... <laughs> You, this is brother's company. <laughs> Our starting point are brother's company, so yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Um, and what's, yeah, what else is interesting is there is that like, because you had the marketing background as well, and I kind of got in thinking, okay, I really like um, copywriting. I, I really like writing in other mediums. I've played video games my whole life. But weirdly enough, like I never thought like I should become a video game writer. I kind of just thought it as something that surely 
I would have had to have taken like another path, right? Like I thought, oh, anyone who is a video game writer, they must have done something different from me. And then as I started kind of doing more narrative content through uh, community development, I was finally asked like, well, why don't you do this in games proper? And so I ended up, um, thanks to a narrative director, uh, Mark Thompson, actually, who was like, hey, I, I really like your stuff. Could you want to help out? I transitioned to become to being a writer at Ubisoft, where I stayed for the next several years. And then it was a couple I, it was a couple years and a couple projects, including one like big canceled project that kind of put me in the same boat that I think you were in, where you're like, OK, I'm in this company now and I'm looking at all the options of things to work on. And I'm like, I don't think any of them are for me right now. Like, I don't think I don't think there's a place for me and I don't really see myself like growing here. So I ended up leaving, becoming freelance. And then within um, that first year, my best friend, Ari and I were like, we should start a company. And we did. And early on, kind of to kind of blend those worlds, we, we kind of started out doing writing and, 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 and freelance stuff and contract work initially, um, mostly me at the time because she was still working full time. Um, and then after that, we got this call where I was asked to come in to a company who was working on like an Afrofuturist game. And the Afrofuturist game had a entirely white writing staff and they were saying, hey, <laughs> <laughs> do you think you can help us? Okay. And I said, well, I, I can definitely help you, but do you have like other black writers on the team? And they said, no, we couldn't find any because they were all like, oh, exactly. One, they couldn't find any. And two, okay. they said like, anyone we found, they were really talented, but they were they were juniors. So we don't have time to train juniors. And so I said, okay. one, I don't think that's necessarily true. And two, what if I train the juniors? Like, what if we would do it so that I will subcontract folks, right? Get them fairly paid. Mm -hmm. And then I'll handle some of like the editing and oversight to make sure that like we're training up to work in video games and then I'll submit the work to you. And that kind of model of like, okay, let's just get a team of people who maybe are juniors and wouldn't necessarily get hired by the big company, but who can kind of come in through Sweet Baby. Let's see if we can make that happen. And that's kind uh, of how so, so we got our second you're meeting. Like, you're an agency, basically. Yep. Writing's agency. Yep. Yep. Okay, that, that, of, you're, you're doing gas work, yeah? We're kind of like, it's, it's funny, because we're kind of like a a combination agency because we don't have like a fixed roster. We don't keep like a, a, a main, a main or maintain a roster and we don't take like a specific cut or anything. No, oh. it's more about just like, in fact, we don't have a cut that we take. <laughs> um, <laughs> the idea is to deliberately work against that. In fact, to say, okay, we're just going to divide up the work and pay you what that work is worth. And okay. if ever we take any extra, it's because it's, uh, the hourly time that we spend with the training, with the management and the editing. So it's kind of like, hey, come and work on this with us, become part of the team for the duration of that contract. And then you'll be paid as though you were just uh, like a writer who was also working with us. Okay. To kind so of basically, like try to, yeah, go ahead. The, your full team is basically the two or three co-founders? Yeah, we're, we're like a, fi a core team of five right now. Okay, five. Um, yeah. Including the two co-founders. And mm -hmm. we're kind of we're starting to slowly grow, and then the rest of 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 the teams that we have, and the rest of the people who work with us, it's on a project by project. Okay, basis. that's kind of interesting because that's what I'm doing personally uh, with my team. So I work on after leaving Toge after uh, releasing Coffee Talk, I work on this small game called What Comes After, and I just like. Uh, so basically, after trying to make a bigger game, I ran out of money and I ran out of idea. So I decided to make a game that can be done in three months. I uh, love that. A one hour game, <laughs> a one hour game that costs five bucks. And God bless Indonesia because we're so cheap here. So uh, the cost to make that game is only 600 bucks for wow. one full game. Yeah, that's the, one, that's the only money we spend. And the theme is just people that I hired for commission or just like hey dude you want to make a game and we share yes. revenue which is like it's, it's a very fishy situation but I cannot I, I cannot pay them anyway <laughs> so yeah we, we work on that game we release it and then for the next project I switch to another theme 
I found new people like, hey, uh, I know you want to make new games, right? Or you, you want to start making games. Why don't you join me? And we make this something, something, something. The difference is for the bigger game, thankfully, I have uh, I have secured the funding. But when uh, a friend of mine asked, like, don't you want to make a studio like with a, uh, with a permanent team? And I was like, taking care of games is way more easier than taking care of humans. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know what though? I I definitely understand that because it's kind of the angle that we took and what's it's been really helpful because I look at at Sweet Baby and I think hmm. can we, you know, because we function so similarly to just like an agency who but, hmm. but we're also like a vendor who just does just writing and narrative stuff. We kind hmm. of have to think like at any given time if we we can't necessarily afford to say okay, we're going to keep 25 to 30 people employed full time. Yep. But we can definitely say, for example, okay, we have $30,000 for this project. We want to cast it with two writers. So we're going to cast it with two writers within that. And then we're going to do the rest of the work ourselves. And we're just all going to split it up and all produce it. And then you end up being able to say, hey, here's two writers who got paid very fairly for their time. They worked yep. through us and we all made we, we all made something successful. And we didn't have to worry about, okay, well, what about the next thing? How will we keep someone employed? Yeah. So we kind of... The, we get the runway to work and stuff like that, yeah. We get, yeah, yeah, yeah. we get to work with more people. We get to like help more people, I think, get, exactly. get a start. And so much of it is about having like more of... We're not looking to, I think, become like a... An, we don't want to become like a big agency of, like, of talent. Mm. We want to just become a place where people can say, yeah, I did like an, uh, a stint at Sweet Baby. I helped write these things. I got these credits. And now I'm moving into into games like my my dream the, the 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 big dirty secret is that i'm like okay when we're helping people maybe in 10 years that person who we gave a junior writing job is a narrative director and they're going to ask <laughs> us to help so maybe maybe we're kind of like okay in 10 years <laughs> we'll talk to you but do you yeah. for, for yourself when it comes to like um developing you're saying there's like a, a very a low price barrier right where you have like mm -hmm. a, you do something on a relatively low budget does mm. that money go very far? Like when people are getting paid for that, like um, does that money like cover all those months? I mean, like uh, throughout the development, you mean like the whole budget? Yeah. Uh, because for the first game, uh, like half of the team were, uh, we just agreed that it's, it's something that everyone should not, follow we, okay, yeah. we actually we actually don't have any contracts at all like hey dude you want to make a game yeah sure and i just signed a contract with my friend for uh the one who so i borrowed my friend's company just to sign the game on steam <laughs> i don't even have my own company so yeah i borrowed my friend's company and we just signed a contract after the game is out like dude we have the game out and we don't have any contracts at all. Like, no, the thing, I, 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 I kind of like that. Now, obviously, that's what I was saying. We always have <laughs> contracts. But yeah. I kind of like this because I, someone was talking to me the other day about um, they were pitching a game and they were saying it's going to cost like X, X dollars. And I said, okay, I think you should probably charge more for that because it's going <laughs> to take more time. And they were saying, no, because we're just we're going to do a lot of work on it for free and that's just the thing we want to do right now and i think there's this obviously there's a rightful stigma in the like in the world of like studios where we need to be paid for our labor right but there's also yep. the other side that realistically as artists and as as people we're going to do stuff for free we're going to, to do yeah. some stuff without contracts we're going to like yeah. build teams that just come together and that don't get ratified like especially when we're doing it like outside of like the studio space so yeah yeah i agree it's like so there's a kind of like that difference between like okay well don't worry we always do the, <laughs> the contracts it's all okay but then on the side you're like yeah, yeah I'll, I'll i'll take a look at your thing for fail I'll, I'll do <laughs> don't worry yeah. about it and i i kind of i i want to talk about that more a lot of the time because mm -hmm. i think as an industry there's so many efforts to like standardize certain things and to say okay we have to mm. do things this way and at the same time there's like this wild west quality where we're just like all figuring it out and you can have a game come out of like either of those worlds you can have a, a yeah. really polished great experience come out of like a polished studio or you can have like a group of people who made something for free and it's the same quality 
I mean, uh, the fact that we don't talk about it as much is the reason why actually I ran out of money when I just started out. Because I think, yeah, I need to pay everyone and I only have my own savings. And I I was afraid to ask my friend like, hey, do, do you want to make games with me? I was so afraid to do that. And that the result is like, I ran out of money in three months. <laughs> Which is like, yep. <laughs> it, it's not a, it's not a good condition. <laughs> so yeah, I think we we should talk about how to do collaboration better, how to ask f- for your teammate or friends to collaborate better, and just admit that there are some phases where you have to ask or just like work f- not for free, but f- for like. How, how should I say it in this <laughs> way? <laughs> There's going to be a balance that you're going to... Like, there are some projects... Um, and actually, so my company still kind of works this way, where mm. we have a lot of clients who are like AAA studios, and obviously, like, for that, you're uh, always... By the way, uh, yeah, go ahead. Your, voice, uh, your voice sounds... How about now? Uh, still a lot of white noise. How about right. now? Okay, now. Good. Really? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In that case, yeah. we'll, tell, <laughs> okay, we'll, 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 we'll see if we can get this part edited out. But if we yep. can't, uh, hopefully it's fixed. Um, yeah, so <laughs> with Sweet Baby, we work with mm. a lot of like AAA studios. And obviously with that, it's going to be like all like major contracts or something. that's going to be all figured out. But then there are times when we'll get approached by um, like an indie developer or like a single developer or someone who's like a junior dev who's trying to create a product. And we know that for that, they're not going to be able to afford the rate that it costs to employ Sweet Baby as a company, right? At this point in, in our in our growth. And so what we do for that is we just say, okay, if you have $500, you can also hire us for that. And to kind of scale down our, our needs and to say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to do a little bit of like, quote unquote, unpaid work on this project, or we're going to do it at a rate that's a lot you know, lower or a lot fairer, but to me, that's what we give back to the industry. Like to me, it's about saying, I understand that this money is going to come to me from other sources and and we're going to redistribute that in a way that, you know, speaks to our values a little bit more. Yeah. And that is kind of the balance. So I don't, I know that, you know, there's there's a great value to saying, hey, you have to always be paid fairly for your work. But to me, that fairly is where I see a little bit of like nuance, because to me, if I'm if I'm doing really well at this time, and obviously we don't always take every contract. Right. But yeah. if, if we're doing well enough and I say, OK, we're stable here, we're happy, then why not say, hey, we can give our expertise to a couple new developers and put something in the world that could be just as good as any of our other work. So it's, it's, the, it's you. It's you put it value. way better than what I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's also that I think you know, for yourself, you're making games. We're we're more like helping games come together. Yeah. Versus our own, like we have we have one of our own little upcoming projects um, for like the play date mm-hmm. coming. Oh. Um, but beyond that, like that's our only like sweet baby product so it's also a lot different i think when you're making something like how do you find do you when, when you're coming up with um these games are you mostly like the leader of these teams do you help build the teams or in your experience have you mostly like worked for other clients so basically um most for my own team i usually lead them although for my latest project because it's bigger than before i realized that i'm a bad producer so I'm a bad programmer and bad producer, so I decided to hire a new producer. But yeah, I usually become the director and I gather the team. So most of the time, uh, I'm the key links between all these people because they don't know each other and their only connection is through me. And I usually find people from friends that I know that they want to make games. Like our programmer has been working on games for a couple of years, but... He's been working on mostly on B2B stuff. And he always wanted to work on indie games, you know, the the kind of indie games you see on Steam. And I was like, hey, I know you're kind of bored to do B2B stuff. Why don't you uh why don't we work together to make this kind of indie games that you see on 
Polygon or Kotaku. And he agreed. And for the artist, uh, I know like she just started she, she just started out and uh, I asked her like, hey, do you want to join? Although for the artist, it was a bit different case because I already got some fundings, but I, I told her like, hey, I know your commission rate is this, 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 and I can pay you, but way below your commission rate. <laughs> uh, are you fine with it? Uh, yeah, of course I can learn something new and I've been wanting to make games anyway. So I usually found, I try to look for team members from my friends that I know they want to make games and uh, I, al- I always have this vision or value I want to tell through my games, through my narrative games and I need to make sure that these are the people that they will like or they will agree with what the games is trying to say. That, that's how I so it kind look of becomes for the team. More of like um, an agreed upon message that you're all like believing in yep. that you're all kind of putting out into the world. And then afterwards, yeah. I imagine like once it's done, <laughs> as you're saying, after that you handle the contracts and stuff in more formal. Uh, <laughs> more formal I mean, like if it's if, if, uh, if it's going out into the world, I mean. Uh, that was only one case because the game is so small. <laughs> but we learned that after after working on that game, I learned that I have to hire somebody like a legal consultant or something. So I don't only I should not only put like developers in the development budget. That's what I learned. I need to put like uh, accounting consultant or legal consultant in the budget too and oh gosh, they yeah. will handle the contracts yeah <laughs> that's something that you will not count until you start working on a game <laughs> so that is yeah that is also part of i think our learning at early on was that especially because we're working with so many contractors there's going to be so many like contracts that have to go in and out that have to go like okay make sure that this is ending on this date make sure that this is you know offering this person the right stuff make sure that this person has like a special ad- amendment in theirs it's it, it it does become this wild kind of like <laughs> this wild experience that's so separate from what you're used to in yep. what it means to work in games the second that you kind of transition from just like day-to-day writing to like more businessy stuff but kind of getting back to like um more like writing and narrative proper. Um, do you do you do you generally work in 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 teams when you're when you're doing narrative work, whether that's freelancing or not, or do you are are you mostly independent? Uh, I usually ask. Uh, it's not really a team. So I, I have this one friend who I trust so much, and she uh, she helps me with the editing, and she helps me with the brainstorming and stuff, and. She also handles like we usually divide the jobs. Like the current game we're working on is a, it's a some kind of dating sim, I guess, and it has like four branches. So I work on the main branch and the two other branches, and she works on the other two branches. So we divide our work like that. And or like for the our previous game, I work on the main story, and she works on the NPCs, like the side stories. So and that's because I learned from Coffee Talk, uh, that project was supposed to be six months project, but basically the deadline for the writing was August twenty eighteen, and I finished writing July twenty nineteen, <laughs> which okay, is so like a very, very yeah. <laughs> you, you, you just missed it. <laughs> yeah, I just missed it. Yeah. So, uh, how, how about you? Like, how how you divide the job with the team or like? So with the contractor for us um we have so when it's internal stuff we kind of divide it very casually <laughs> when it's okay. internal stuff like i do a lot of like the bulk of the the writing and um some narrative design and then uh dbed who works with us he does like a lot of um for example like pure narrative design like more technical game designy stuff um, okay. so a lot of like we'll have a lot of talks around structure whereas um like Ari will handle like a lot of our admin stuff and, and then also come in for like brainstorms and some writing stuff. So it's kind of like that's kind of the way we, we handle it. And for every project that we have, like one of us might take point on it. So I'll be the one in, in meetings. I'll, I'll do the bulk of the work, but I'll kind of like run it past the team, make almost like a like a writer's room yeah. to say, hey, this joke that I've written here is not working. I've been working on it for, for like an hour. Please help me. <laughs> um, and for some others, like we're just kind of team, we're, we're, we're just attack it like a team, divide up the work. Um, For contractors, because of the way that we want to work and to make, to really like make sure that we're not 
over indexing anywhere, we take like, whatever the contract is, we divide the work like very clearly, and then we assign like a value of that work. And then we say to whoever's going to help us, he here's what um, here's what the contract is. Here are the exact like work. It's almost like a work order more than more okay. than like, a contract. So it's more like here you're going to be paid this much for these responsibilities, and these are your like key deliverables. Because I okay. find that yeah. like for especially for us like we work very much, and especially in the past year with like the pandemic and being like out of like being remote 100% of the time with all of our teams and teammates. Um, we're super focused on like really narrowing down what our responsibilities are into deliverables okay. so that we always know, okay, what are we working on next? And I think yeah. in an office, you can be a little more casual to say like, okay, what's this? Like, we'll, we'll talk to somebody. I'll go, Hey, what do you actually need? What does this look like? But because of everything that's been happening, it's like, okay, we need like 10 scripts we need 1500 barks we need this and we try to like really be careful to keep that work from accidentally like spilling over becoming too big or or, or changing and um, that's what's happening yeah. with me right now so we, yeah exactly right so we lead with we lead with the price we lead with the value and then anything after that that falls outside of that you're like okay we're gonna do another contract or whatever it is but it's always just like we're hiring you for this and that is kind of how we, we, we tend to work so that we can generally be like a little machine because we know we're not going to see each other. <laughs> so I need to know what I have to produce at any time. And it used to be more like we'd be in an office and I'd say, okay, I'm going to do 75% of this. Do you want to help finish it off? And now it's like, no, we're just going <laughs> to do that. Do you find that... Um, so I, I've I've been working like 100% remote for a while and prior to the pandemic like sweet baby was still all, often very remote because we work with so many teams that it doesn't make sense to like go um to one place and then we kind of had like even though we had an office of our own we were still remote to our clients okay yeah so for yourself um do you do like it, it, do you, the people you work with are they mostly remote or or mostly local or both I mean, like, uh, all of us are Indonesians, but we live in different cities. And to be honest, I find working from home to be uh, liberating. It feels amazing. And it saves a lot of money because before this, I always work from coffee shops. Oh my gosh, which, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it costs a lot of money. And, and I don't know what happened, but right after the lockdown started, my laptop just died. Oh no! So it was like I have a PC at home, so it was like a perfect time to start working from home <laughs> because I cannot use my laptop anymore. And so yeah, I mean, working from home was amazing. Uh, doing remote work is again, this is something that made me realize that I'm a bad producer. Is that when we work on what comes after, uh, we only did one meeting for the whole project. We only did one meeting and it was like one week before release. What? Everything <laughs> everything was done on Discord and we just talk when we want to. And okay, we realized, so this wow, is, this is such this a... This sounds <laughs> great because I have to say, I have extreme Zoom fatigue. Every like <laughs> On the regular, I will look at my schedule and there's six or six and a half Zoom meetings a day just with different things or like even like work sessions with like co-writers or, or, or co-workers or something i need to like this is this is very interesting to me <laughs> so it's like wait a second can we just not have meetings um i so as far as our we, we also had we had an office actually right before the pandemic mm. we were like six or eight months in and we were like yeah okay. got a nice little space it was one of those kind of like co-working spaces that you kind of rent out like a, a space in and we were like yeah, so okay. super happy we set it up we got like we, ha we finally had like a sign put up like oh, nice. weeks, weeks, weeks before the pandemic. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, nothing's going to change this. We're doing great. And then the pandemic hit. And I still remember going like, all right, two weeks and we're back. It's just two weeks. We could do this. And then <laughs> two months in, we were like, okay, so we're just going to give up our office, right? Like we're not paying the rent on this. We're like, yep, yeah, yeah, we're done. And we haven't had it since. And I think I, it's funny. I very much agree. I think for my direct team because there's there's I'm there's so much my friends as well and because we work so closely I miss having a space to go I miss being able to say okay 
get up in the morning, especially especially here. I live in Montreal. It's super cold, like <laughs> for half the year. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, I want to have another space to at least give an excuse for me to get out of the house. But at the same time, I love the work from home thing because for I guess for two reasons. One, just personally, I like it because I can now really be comfortable in my space. I can work however I want. I can kind of adjust my own schedule. I don't have to have that like that time that you that you have in any office. Um, like when you're when I was full time, for example, like at, at Ubisoft, you're doing work, but some day some days you go, okay, I finished my work early, but I'd better still sit here <laughs> for three hours because I don't want to look like I've done something <laughs> wrong, and I also don't want to like bother anyone right now so i'm just gonna like kind of try to do that and you have this like crushing guilt and now i'm like oh i can manage my schedule it's okay that sometimes at 3 p.m i'm not going to do anything because for me if 8 p.m feels better to work and i say hey i'm just gonna sit down at my desk and go like 8 to 10 p.m that's cool it's i'm not doing any more hours but i'm doing it around my own schedule and then the other thing i really like is that because we work with with so many clients having everyone be remote has really like leveled the playing field in a way that I think I've never seen before because yeah. now it's not just like, Hey, we're the little outsiders hopping in remotely. It's everyone is remote. We're joining teams. I'm parts of more writer's rooms because writer rooms are now online. So it's not like, Hey Kim, we had a writer's room. Here's some takeaways. It's like, Hey, come and join us because we're all doing this. And it's been really, really rewarding also with even some of our like AAA clients to see them, these studios that previously were like, hey, we're, you're going to have to move here or who, you know, it's kind of tacit agreement that like, yeah, it's, it's best for you to be local are suddenly saying, no, if you want to live in another city, your work is great. That's cool. And it's been really nice to see that shift away from like, hey, it's the beginning of the pandemic. Obviously we'll hire you, but eventually you have to move to kind of like, you know what, this is working well, maybe you don't have to move and maybe we can make it so that like the office is a flexible place. Maybe we can try to normalize Zoom meetings in that way so that more people can get involved. And like, especially again, from like people from marginalized backgrounds, people who don't necessarily like have the ability for whatever reason to go to a new city to, to, to move yeah. there can now participate. And I'm like, yes, let's please keep this after the pandemic I mean, is over. As someone that, Uh, that lives in Indonesia this is like a total game changer like I can be anywhere with I mean like I, I never been to GDC because it costs like oh, ten thousand dollars for us so, to go there like, it's <laughs> so expensive it's which is such a shame exactly. because you're like hey we want to have this like big conference of game developers from all over the world and it's like but only the rich ones <laughs> <laughs> yep and if only if you have the US visa which feels like a gacha Yeah, yeah, it's so hard. I've been I've been lucky enough to go, but the first time it was because I got like um I was invited to do a program, so it was like a free like GDC little scholarship program, um called Amplifying New Voices, and the second time it was because at that point I had a company, and I was doing a talk, so the badge which I think costs a couple thousand dollars gets yeah. offset by that talk by speaking fee, and I realized while I was there I said. The only way to to really get a cheap ticket to GDC is to do a talk. Yep. <laughs> Or, Or you be know, a to, journalist. To, to the other programs. Yep. Uh, be a freelance writer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it's it's so prohibitive in that way. And I wish it was more open. And now it kind of is, right? So yeah. have you been able? Like, do you find that um, people are more willing to have that conversation with you? People are more willing to like seek you out in a different way and. and And, and work oh, yeah, you. I mean, like, I've been like doing more more talks during the pandemic compared to. I mean, it it might also happen because I released a game like two months before the pandemic, and so people said, "Oh, hey, this dude made coffee talk." But I mean, like before this, I only did like a talk a year or two talks a year, and now I, I'm doing like way more than I should be. <laughs> so <laughs> why can't I hold all these talks? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Um, which <laughs> more than you should be. I like that. So, I, but I, I, I do think that that's really, really great because for your, 
yourself, you're someone whose game I have I have played, but who I have not <laughs> like. And now to meet you, it's like this is this is such a great opportunity, and it's partially great because it's on Zoom, you know. Yep. And I think that Luden Aricon was previously on on that anyway, but yep. Um, I also have been doing more talks because they now don't have to worry about saying, hey, we can fly you there, we can put you in a hotel. So it's even more sustainable for people to say, okay, well, come and talk whoever you are. And I found that, like, at least for myself, I can say, okay, because there's no, like, hotel and, and payment, they can now offer me a speaker's fee that is either yep. higher or existing, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> for that. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's great. There's, there's something that's, that's, that's changed. And I, I think, you know, and, and, and the other thing is I think you're probably making relationships with, with conventions and with, with, with speaking opportunities that when the world is kind of like a little more back to quote unquote normal, they will probably invite you down to fly. So like you're able to make these, hopefully these online connections. Yeah. These online connections, <laughs> that I think will move into the, I guess, I guess into the new world. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's, that's kind of the hope for, for me. Like I really find that my, my work has improved during all of the, all of this stuff. And it's not because of, you know, it's, it's, it's not because of it. It's of, of, anything that it's in the conversation or in, in society necessarily, but it's the fact that we're moving towards a model that seems to at least value the space of individuals yep. and is not putting us in, especially, you know, after everything that, that came out this summer 2020 um, about like the industry and all the toxicity within it, we're no longer putting people in these offices where they're going to encounter a lot of toxicity the same way. And obviously yep. that can still be a problem online, but I'm starting to see so many more people feel comfortable representing themselves, feel comfortable, you know, speaking up, feel comfortable working in, in teams. Because it's a lot, I find, at least for me, it's a lot easier to go like, hey, I've got something to say that's really, really important. And then after I say it, I'm going to just hit leave meeting <laughs> and, and not yeah. have to like awkwardly pass you by in the hallway yeah. because we had a weird interaction <laughs> like it's 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 kind of it's 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 kind of nice yep, yep i i can understand that yeah yeah and a... and i also find that having having a similar working environment to other game developers like now we're all working from our home <laughs> so obviously some people have like different homes different sizes different income brackets different whatever but we all have this common experience right now of saying okay we're in this space and that i also think is can only be be helped because i find that it's it's made us or maybe i mean maybe you tell me if you find this like it's made us a little bit more understanding of everyone's situation. And for myself, I've seen it kind of reflected in a lot of ways in saying, okay, we have to take care of our real lives and work more deliberately towards like work-life balance and sustainable development. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah, it's, 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 it feels like, I, I, I do feel like since working from home, I, take care more I, I took more time to take care of myself like before this I just like work and then I only play or watch Netflix at home but now I need to make sure that hey Fami stop working and now it's time to watch Netflix oh my gosh yeah. you put the, you put those berries on yourself so it's hard at the beginning you will overwork yourself yep. in the first one year probably and after that things will get better hopefully it's honestly uh, so, Fami, that's the most comforting thing that anyone's ever said to me because I went through the exact same thing where I have been, I have overworked so much because of that feeling. Like, I saw a, a tweet about it that I that I quote now that someone was saying, hey, just reminder, you're not working from home right now. You're living at work. And I was like, oh, man, that's so true because there would be times when I, 
especially from someone like myself, who's very much like, oh, I want to be productive. I want to always be doing things. I want to yep. always be focusing on different things. I have so many things to do. I say, okay, well, it's it's 5 p.m. Time to, to, to hang out, do whatever I want, hang out with my boyfriend, like play with my cats, like what, play a video game or something. <laughs> but then I go past my desk and I'm like, but I could do that. You know, like that would be productive. So I should probably just go back there. <laughs> and so I just go back to the desk because what's stopping me, right? It's like, why not work? Yep. And then all of a sudden you're like, I'm vast. I'm working way harder than I ever have. And more consistently where I'm like, okay, yeah, just going to hang out and do 10 hours because I can probably get ahead of this work. And someone asks you to do something. You're like, yeah, I can absolutely do it. I have endless yep. days. I have, I have no time. Time does not exist for me anymore. I'm just this like yeah. creature who can constantly work. <laughs> I'm, I am this like, ADHD goddess who can just like look at everything <laughs> and then you do that for ages kind of not accounting for what you're doing to yourself and then you're like why am I tired all the time and suddenly you realize that rest is something you have to do for yourself it is also yeah. productive because yep. I I had no problem when I was working in an office because you have that like, okay, I got to get out of here. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't want to be here anymore. And you leave and you don't have all of your stuff with you. So mm. even if at 8 p.m. or at, at 10 p.m. I'm lying in, I'm, I'm not lying in bed at 8. I'm, I, I promise I do things. <laughs> um, or if I'm at a restaurant having dinner or something because I go out, I might go like, ugh, I got to gotta work on that. But it's not, I can't, I'm not going to go back to the office. I'm not going to like yep. trek across town. But now I think, oh, it's really you can just go to your room I and start go, working on yeah, it. Yeah, I can just go to my room. Or worse, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm like, I got my phone right here. Oh, I can just yeah. all those emails I was thinking about, why not just do it here? And so yeah, this these last especially in twenty twenty one, these past couple of months have been like, Okay, Kim, you can structure your day. <laughs> you can say at this time you get to unwind and that's important. And embarrassingly it started for me at least with like i had to set meetings for myself to go like hang out play hades do something <laughs> and that was the, the way that i ended up convincing myself yeah the, the mindset of that we can work anytime uh it affects us so negatively that when we fail to do things like we we've done some things and then we fail to do one thing that we just decided to add on the like last yep. hour of the day we felt like oh shit i'm not productive enough it it actually yes. took me like it took me like months thinking that i'm not productive until my sister said but you release a game yeah but i have so many things to do yep. but you release a game that's yep. true i guess yeah <laughs> you need someone to tell you that no achievement you're actually is enough doing things yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's so it's so bad cuz i do the same thing where i will finish a bunch of stuff or do a bunch of work but it doesn't count unless it's like a submission yeah. it's like that's yeah, just like exactly. if i have a document or i've if i've like shipped something then okay but even then you have that problem where you go okay so that shipped which means it was doable which means it's not a challenge which means it doesn't matter it's fine move on instantly to the next thing and 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 just try to figure it out you know like that i find is so that that is that is tough. So I think How long have... just to kind of like oh oh are you having a recording issue? No, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, like uh, I just deleted the game on Steam because I almost ran out of my space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's very good. That's very funny. <laughs> um, I think it's just like. To kind of um, wrap up, I think I would ask, like, with with your with everything that I think you've learned both, like, in your career and throughout these this year and a half, like, how do you see the I guess you know the next few years of your career? Like, what do you, what what do you want to do? What are the things that excite you? Um, obviously, finish finish my new game because it's actually not a new game it's just a game that I've I decided to hold until I get enough fundings so I want to finish it uh, and because my other job is trying to help 
local dev, I mean Indonesian dev to get global attention. I wish I can see more Indonesian games have more exposure because uh 2020 has 2020 was a bad year, but it it's been an amazing year for Indonesian video games because we have at least two or three successful games globally and i wish that i can see more of them in the f- near future and i hope i'm i'm part of those <laughs> success <laughs> definitely yeah what about you i think for myself um i'd like to be able to grow grow the company a, a little bit help more people like get more jobs <laughs> i think work towards <laughs> that and then I think I'd also like to create something like I think um, I don't know if that means a game. I don't know what that actually means, but I think like we're starting to do like a, a series of workshops right now with Sweet Baby to, to do like game dev yeah. and narrative dev and like just do talks and stuff. I really want to like be able to focus on, on doing a lot of that stuff because for me, I think we're always going to, like we're in a re- really good position where I think we're always going to be able to work on narrative projects. We're always going to be like, we have a good flow of projects, of clients, of relationships that we built there, and I think we're going to be good. So now, like in the next, I want to really focus on like community stuff and seeing what we can do okay. about like, especially sustainability in in games for people and about like making sure that we're not all we're not all just burning out constantly. <laughs> Because you see it so much, and yeah, I I, I really want to work towards that. I think that's that's my goal. Yep. Um, and I think I think that's about time for us. I think that's all the, like most of the time that we have. So, hmm. just to finish, where can people find you, and what do you want people to 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 see? So yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Mostly, I only post like memes and shit posts about anime uh, uh, at Famitsu. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a part of my name in Famitsu magazine. So Famitsu. I know, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can actually find uh, our game called What Comes After as part of the uh, Ludo Nara consoles. And if things go well, I should be announcing my game in this event. Hopefully things are going well. So, yeah. Congratulations in, in advance or or belatedly, whichever one. Uh, congratulations in brackets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you? yeah. Uh, I am Bagel of Death on Twitter, where mostly oh. yeah, mostly it is retweets <laughs> and occasionally just like pictures of my cats. Um, and then um, Sweet Baby Inc is uh, at Sweet Baby Inc on Twitter or on Instagram if you want to follow us there. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Um, from Fami, I'm I've been Kimball Air, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of Ludo Naricon. Thank you. Bye.